This morning, we continue our hearing on the nomination of Judge Brent Kavanaugh to serve as Associate Justice on our Supreme Court. We will hear from two witnesses, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford and Judge Kavanaugh. <clears throat> Sexual violence is a serious problem and one that largely goes unseen. In the United States, it's estimated by the Centers for De Disease Control, one in three women and one in six men will experience some form of sexual violence in their lifetime. According to the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, 60% of sexual assaults go unreported. In addition, when survivors do report their assaults, it's often years later due to the trauma they suffered and fearing their stories will not be believed. Last week, I received a letter from a 60-year-old California constituent who told me that she survived an attempted rape at age 17. She described as being terrified and embarrassed. She never told a soul until much later in life. The assault stayed with her for 43 years. I think it's important to remember these realities as we hear from Dr. Ford about her experience. There's been a great deal of public discussion about the Me Too movement today versus the year of the woman almost 27 years ago. But while young women are standing up and saying no more, our institutions have not progressed in how they treat women who come forward. Too often, women's memories and credibility come under assault. In essence, they are put on trial and forced to defend themselves and often re-victimized in the process. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Grassley and rank Ranking Member Feinstein, members of the committee. My name is Christine Blasey Ford. I am a professor of psychology at Palo Alto University and a research psychologist at the Stanford University School of Medicine. I am here today not because I want to be. I am terrified. I am here because I believe it is my civic duty to tell you what happened to me while Brett Kavanaugh and I were in high school. During my freshman and sophomore school years, when I was 14 and 15 years old, my group of friends intersected with Brett and his friends for a short period of time. I had been friendly with a classmate of Brett's for a short time during my freshman and sophomore year. And it was through that connection that I attended a number of parties that Brett also attended. We did not know each other well, but I knew him and he knew me. One evening that summer, after a day of diving at the club, I attended a small gathering at a house in the Bethesda area. There were four boys I remember specifically being at the house. Brett Kavanaugh, Mark Judge, a boy named PJ, and one other boy whose name I cannot recall. I also remember my friend Leland attending. I do not remember all of the details of how that gathering came together, but like many that summer, it was almost surely a spur of the moment gathering. I truly wish I could be more helpful with more detailed answers to all of the questions that have and will be asked about how I got to the party and where it took place and so forth. I don't have all the answers and I don't remember as much as I would like to. But the details that, about that night that bring me here today are the ones I will never forget. They have been seared into my memory and have haunted me episodically as an adult. When I got to the small gathering, people were drinking beer in a small living room, family room type area on the first floor of the house. I drank one beer. Brett and Mark were visibly drunk. Early in the evening, I went up a very narrow set of stairs leading from the living room to a second floor to use the restroom. When I got to the top of the stairs, I was pushed from behind into a bedroom across from the bathroom. I couldn't see who pushed me. Brett and Mark came into the bedroom and locked the door behind them. 
There was music playing in the bedroom. It was turned up louder by either Brett or Mark once we were in the room. I was pushed onto the bed and Brett got on top of me. He began running his hands over my body and grinding into me. I yelled, hoping that someone downstairs might hear me, and I tried to get away from him, but his weight was heavy. Brett groped me and tried to take off my clothes. He had a hard time because he was very inebriated and because I was wearing a one-piece bathing suit underneath my clothing. I believed he was going to rape me. I tried to yell for help. When I did, Brett put his hand over my mouth to stop me from yelling. This is what terrified me the most and has had the most lasting impact on my life. It was hard for me to breathe and I thought that Brett was accidentally going to kill me. Both Brett and Mark were drunkenly laughing during the attack. They seemed to be having a very good time. Mark seemed ambivalent, at times urging Brett on, and at times telling him to stop. A couple of times I made eye contact with Mark and thought he might try to help me, but he did not. During this assault, Mark came over and jumped on the bed twice while Brett was on top of me. And the last time that he did this, we toppled over and Brett was no longer on top of me. I was able to get up and run out of the room. Directly across from the bedroom was a small bathroom. I ran inside the bathroom and locked the door. I waited until I heard Brett and Mark leave the bedroom, laughing and loudly walk down the narrow stairway, pinballing off the walls on the way down. I waited and when I did not hear them come back up the stairs, I left the bathroom, went down the same stairwell, through the living room, and left the house. I remember being on the street and feeling an enormous sense of relief that I had escaped that house and that Brett and Mark were not coming outside after me. Brett's assault on me drastically altered my life. For a very long time, I was too afraid and ashamed to tell anyone these details. I told my husband before we were married that I had experienced a sexual assault. I had never told the details to anyone, the specific details, until May 2012 during a couple's counseling session. The reason this came up in counseling is that my husband and I had completed a very extensive, very long remodel of our home and I insisted on a second front door, an idea that he and others disagreed with and could not understand. In explaining why I wanted a second front door, I began to describe the assault in detail. I recall saying that the boy who assaulted me could someday be on the US Supreme Court and spoke a bit about his background at an elitist all boys school in Bethesda, Maryland. My husband recalls that I named my attacker as Brett Kavanaugh. After that May 2012 therapy session, I did my best to ignore the memories of the assault because recounting them caused me to relive the experience and caused panic and anxiety. Occasionally, I would discuss the assault in an individual therapy session, but talking about it caused more reliving of the trauma, so I tried not to think about it or discuss it. But over the years, I went through periods where I thought about the attack. I had confided in some close friends that I had had an experience with sexual assault. Occasionally, I stated that my assailant was a prominent lawyer or judge, but I did not use his name. I do not recall each person I spoke to about Brett's assault and some friends have reminded me of these conversations since the publication of the Washington Post story on September 16th, 2018. But until July 2018, I had never named Mr. Kavanaugh as my attacker outside of therapy. This changed in early July 2018. I saw press reports stating that Brett Kavanaugh was on the short list 
of a list of very well-qualified Supreme Court nominees. I thought it was my civic duty to relay the information I had about Mr. Kavanaugh's conduct so that those considering his nomination would know about this assault. Can you tell us what impact the events had on you? Um, well, I think that the sequelae of sexual assault varies by person. So for me personally, uh, anxiety, phobia, and PTSD-like symptoms are the types of things that I've been coping with. So uh, more specifically, claustrophobia, panic, and that type of thing. Is that the reason for the second door, front door? Correct. Is claustrophobia? Correct. It doesn't, our house does not look aesthetically pleasing from the curb. Dr. Ford, thank you uh, for being here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you know, the, the way to make this inquiry truly credible is to do what we've always done when new information about nominee comes to light. <coughs> To use your words this morning, uh, you want to reach the truth. The easy way to do that, ask the FBI to investigate. This is what we've always done. Let them investigate, report back to us. The same applies to the serious allegations made by uh, Deborah Ramirez and uh, Julie Swetnick. Let's have a nonpartisan professional investigation and then take the time to have these witnesses testify. Chairman, you and I were both here 27 years ago. At that time, the Senate failed Anita Hill. I said I believed her, but I'm concerned that we're doing a lot less for these three women today. That's my personal view. Now, some senators have suggested you were simply mixed up about who assaulted you. An ally of Judge Kavanaugh in the White House even promoted a wild theory about a Kavanaugh look-alike. You immediately rejected that theory, as did the innocent man who had been called that look-alike. In fact, he sent a letter to this committee forcefully rejecting this absurd theory, and I ask consent to enter that in the record. Now, is, how did you know Brett Kavanaugh and Mark Judge? And is it possible that you would mix them up with somebody else? No, it is not. And the person that was uh, blamed for the incident is actually the person who introduced me to them originally. So he was a member of Columbia Country Club, and I don't want to talk about him because I think it's unfair, but he is the person that, that introduced me to them. But you, you would not mix up somebody else with Brett Kavanaugh, is that correct? Correct. Or Mark Judge. Correct. Well, then let's go back to the incident. What is the strongest memory you have? The strongest memory of the incident, something that you cannot forget. Take whatever time you need. Indelible in the hippocampus is the laughter, the, la the uproarious laughter between the two, and they're having fun at my expense. You've never forgotten that laughter. You've never forgotten them laughing at you. They were laughing with each other. And you were the object of the laughter? I was you know, underneath one of them while the two laughed. Two, fr two friends having a really good time with one another. And Dr. Ford has at times been criticized for what she doesn't remember from 36 years ago. But we have numerous experts, including a study by the U.S. Army Military Police School Behavior Sciences Education, that lapses of memory are wholly consistent with severe trauma and stress of assault. And I'd ask consent that be entered. Without objection, so ordered. And Dr. Ford, I'll just conclude with this. You do remember what happened, do you not? Very much so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, now, uh, Ms. Mitchell for Senator Graham, and then it's my understanding that, uh, that that's where you'd like to take a break. Does that work for you? Does that work for you as well? Uh, 
we, we're here to accommodate you, not oh, you thank accommodate you. us. I, I'm used to being collegial. So. Okay, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Ford, with what degree of certainty do you believe Brett Kavanaugh assaulted you? 100%. 100%. In the letter which you sent to Dr. Feinstein, or Senator Feinstein, you wrote, I have not knowingly seen Kavanaugh since the assault. I did see Mark Judge once at the Potomac Village Safeway where he was extremely uncomfortable in seeing me. Would you please describe that encounter at the Safeway with Mark Judge and what led you to believe he was uncomfortable? Yes, I was going to the Potomac Village Safeway. This is the one on the corner of Falls and River Road. And I was with my mother and I was a teenager so I wanted her to go in one door and me go in the other. So um, I chose the wrong door because the door I chose was the one where Mark Judge was, uh, looked like he was working there and uh, arranging the shopping carts. And I said hello to him. And his face was white uh, and very uncomfortable saying hello back. Uh, and we had previously been friendly at the times that we saw each other over the previous two years, albeit not very many times, we had always been friendly with one another. Um, I wouldn't characterize him as not friendly. He was just nervous and not really wanting to speak with me. How and he, he looked a little bit ill. How long did this occur after the incident? Uh, I would estimate six to eight weeks. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Blasey Ford. A lot of people are proud of you today. Um, from a prosecutor's eye view, one of the hardest things that uh, we have to do is to speak to somebody who's come forward with an allegation of sexual assault and let them know that we can't provide the evidence to go forward to trial. It's a hard day for the prosecutor to do that. And so, both because making a sincere and thorough investigative effort is such an important consolation to the victim in that circumstance and because it's what you're obliged to do professionally, sincere and thorough investigation is critical to these claims in a prosecutor's world. It may be the most basic thing that we owe a victim or a witness coming forward is to make sure that we give them a full, thorough, and sincere investigation. You have met all of the standards of what I might call preliminary credibility with your uh, initial statement. Um, you have uh, vivid, specific, and detailed recollections, something prosecutors look for. Your uh, recollections are consistent with known facts. Um, you made prior consistent statements, something else uh, prosecutors and lawyers look for. You were willing to and, and did take a lie detector test. And you were willing to testify here. Here you are, subject to professional cross-examination by a prosecutor. So you've met any condition uh, any prosecutor could expect to go forward, and yet there has been no sincere or thorough investigation of your claims. You specifically asked for an FBI investigation, did you not? Yes. And are you aware that when the FBI begins investigating, they might find corroborative evidence and they might find exculpatory evidence? I don't know what exculpatory is evidence it, is. Uh, not helpful to your uh, recollection and, and version of events, helpful to the accused. Understood, yes. So it could go either way. Yes. And you were still not just willing, but insistent that the FBI should investigate your recollection and your claim. Yes, I feel like it would, I could be more helpful in that, if that was the case, in providing some of the details that maybe people are wanting to know about. And, and as we know, they didn't. And I submit that never 
never in the history of background investigations has an investigation not been pursued when new, credible, derogatory information was brought forward about the nominee or the candidate. I don't think this has ever happened in the history of FBI background investigations. Maybe somebody can prove me wrong, but it's wildly unusual and out of character. And uh, in my view, it is a grave disservice to you, and I want to take this moment to apologize to you for that, and to report to anybody who might be listening that when somebody's willing to come forward, even under those circumstances, even having been not given the modicum of courtesy and support of a proper investigation, um, you've shown yourself particularly proud uh, in, in doing that. And the responsibility for the decision to have this be, I think, the only background investigation in history to be stopped as derogatory information came forward belongs with 13 men. The President, Director Ray of the FBI, and the 11 members of the majority of this committee. As to the committee's investigation, the fact that uh, Mr. Kavanaugh's alleged accomplice has not been subpoenaed, has not been examined and cross-examined under oath, has not been interviewed by the FBI, tells you all you need to know about how credible this performance is. Um, in reading the Washington Post article, it mentions that this incident that we're here about contributed to anxiety and PTSD problems with which you have struggled. The word contributed, does that mean that there are other things that have happened that have also contributed to anxiety and PTSD? I think that's a great question. I think the etiology of anxiety and PTSD is multifactorial. So um, that was certainly a critical risk risk that uh, we would call it a risk factor in science. So that would be a predictor of the symptoms that I now have. Uh, it doesn't mean that other things that have happened in my life would, have, would make it worse or better. There are other risk factors as well. So have there been other things then that have contributed to the anxiety and PTSD that you suffered? Well, I think there's sort of biological predispositions that everyone in here has for particular disorders. So I can't rule out that I would have some biological predisposition to be what you about know, an anxious type person. What about environmental? Um, environmentally, uh, not that I can think of. Okay. Certainly no, nothing as striking as that event. Okay. Under federal law, and I don't expect you to know this, but statements made to medical professionals are considered to be more reliable. There's a federal rule of evidence about this. Uh, you told your counselor about this back in 2012, is that right? My therapist, mm -hmm. my individual therapist, correct. Right, and I understand that your husband was also present when you spoke about this incident in front of a counselor and he recalls you using Judge Kavanaugh's name, is that right? Yes, I just have to slow down a minute because I might have been confusing. So there were two separate incidents yes. where it's reflected in my medical record. I had talked about it more than those two times, mm -hmm. um, but therapists don't typically write down content as much as they write down process. They usually are tracking your symptoms and not your mm -hmm. story and the facts. I just happened right. to have it in my record twice. So the first time is in 2012 with my husband in couples therapy with the quibbling over the remodel. And then in 2013 with my individual okay. therapy. So if, if uh, someone had actually done an investigation, your husband would have been able to say that you named his name at that time. Correct. Many people are focused today on what you're not able to remember about that night. I actually think you remember a lot. I'm gonna phrase it a little differently. Can you tell us what you don't forget about that night? The stairwell, the living room, the bedroom, the bed on the right side of the room. As you walk into the room, there was a bed to the right. Um, the bathroom in close proximity. 
the laughter, the uproarious laughter, and the multiple attempts to escape, and the final ability to do so. And Mr. Chairman, could I put the polygraph uh, results on the uh, record, please? The polygraph results in the record. Without it. But, is there any objection? Well, well, let us see the chart. The polygraph? You want to all see it? You hold just a minute, I, please. I think you may have it. Yeah, can we have the underlying charts, too? The underlying charts? I have the polygraph results that I would just like to put in the record. I'll, uh, I'll deal with the charts after that. Could I put the polygraph tests in the record? Mr. Chairman, we were uh, we had proposed uh, having the polygraph examiner testify, as you know. If that had happened, the full panoply of materials that he had supporting his examination would have been provided. You rejected that request, so what we did provide uh, was the polygraph report, which is what the members of the committee currently have. Did you contact the New York Times? No. Okay, why not? Uh, I wasn't interested in pursuing the media route, particularly, uh, so I felt like one was enough, the Washington Post, and I was nervous about doing that. My preference was to talk with my congressperson. I think a lot of people don't realize that you chose to come forward with your concerns about Judge Kavanaugh before he was nominated to the Supreme Court. Do I understand correctly that when you, when you first reached out to Congresswoman Eshoo and to the Washington Post tip line, that was when he was on the short list, but before he was nominated to the Supreme Court, is that correct? Correct. And if I understood your testimony earlier, it's that you were motivated by a sense of civic duty and, and frankly a hope that some other highly qualified nominee might be picked not out of a motivation um, at a late stage to have an impact on the final decision? Correct. I felt it was very important to get the information to you, but I didn't know how to do it while there was still a short list of candidates. Thank you, Doctor. Um, you know, experts have written about how it's common um, for sexual assault survivors to remember some facts about the experience very sharply and very clearly. Uh, but not others, and that has to do with the survival mode um, that we go into in experiencing trauma. Um, is that your experience, and is that something you can help the layperson understand? Yes, I was definitely experiencing the fight or flight mode. Is that what you're referring to? Yes, yeah, yeah. so I was definitely experiencing the surge of adrenaline and cortisol and norepinephrine, and credit that a little bit for my ability to get out of the situation. Um, but also some other lucky events that occurred that well, allowed me to get out of the event. Let me tell you why I believe you. Not only because of the prior consistent statements and the polygraph tests and your request for an FBI investigation and your urging that this committee hear from other witnesses who could corroborate or dispute your story, but also you have been very honest about what you cannot remember. And someone composing a story can make it all come together in a seamless way, but someone who is honest, I speak from my experience as a prosecutor as well, is also candid about what she or he cannot remember. We all know that the prosecutor, even though this clearly is not a criminal proceeding, is asking Dr. Ford all kinds of questions about what happened before and after, but basically not during the attack. The prosecutor should know that sexual assault survivors often do not remember peripheral information such as what happened before or after the traumatic event. And yet, she will persist in asking these questions all to undermine the memory and basically the credibility of Dr. Ford. But we all know Dr. Ford's memory of the assault is very clear. Dr. Ford, the Republicans prosecutor has asked you all kinds of questions about who you called and when, asking details that would be asked in a cross-examination of a witness in a criminal trial. But this is not a criminal proceeding. This is a confirmation proceeding. 
I think I know what she's trying to get at. So I'll just ask you very plainly, Dr. Ford, is there a political motivation for your coming forward with your account of the assault by Brett Kavanaugh? No, and I'd like to reiterate that, again, I was trying to get the information to you while there was still a list of other Thank you. What looked like equally qualified candidates. Dr. Ford, first of all, just so we can level set, you know you are not on trial. <laughs> you are not on trial. You are sitting here before members of the United States Senate's Judiciary Committee because you had the courage to come forward because, as you have said, you believe it was your civic duty. I was struck in your testimony by what you indicated as your intention when you first let anyone associated with these hearings know about it. And what you basically said is, you reached out to your representative in the United States Congress, hoping that person would inform the White House before Judge Kavanaugh had been named. That's extremely persuasive about your motivation for coming forward. And so I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your courage, and I want to tell you I believe you. I believe you. And I believe many Americans across this country believe you. And what I find striking about your testimony is you remember key searing details of what happened to you. You told your husband and therapist, two of the most intimate of your confidants, and you told them years ago about this assault. You have shared your experience with multiple friends years after that and before these hearings ever started. I know, having personally prosecuted sexual assault cases and child sexual assault cases, that study after study shows trauma, shame, and the fear of consequences almost always cause survivors to, at the very least, delay reporting if they ever report at all. Police recognize that. Prosecutors recognize that. Medical and mental health professionals recognize that. The notes from your therapy sessions were created long before this nomination and corroborate what you have said today. You have passed a polygraph, polygraph and submitted the results to this committee. Judge Kavanaugh has not. You have called for outside witnesses to testify and for expert witnesses to testify. Judge Kavanaugh has not. But most importantly, you have called for an independent FBI investigation into the facts. Judge Kavanaugh has not. And we owe you that. We owe the American people that. And let's talk about why this is so important. Contrary to what has been said today, the FBI does not reach conclusions. The FBI investigates. It interviews witnesses, gathers facts, and then presents that information to the United States Senate for our consideration and judgment. This committee knows that, in spite of what you have been told. In 1991, during a similar hearing, one of my rep Republican colleagues in this committee stated these claims were taken seriously by having the Federal Bureau of Investigations launch an inquiry to determine their validity. The FBI fulfilled its duty and issued a confidential report. Well, that could have and should have been done here. This morning, it was said that this could have been investigated confidentially back in July. But this also could have been investigated in the last 11 days since you came forward. Yet that has not happened. The FBI could have interviewed Mark Judge, Patrick Smith, Leland, Leland Kaiser, you and Judge Kavanaugh on these issues. The FBI could have examined various maps that have been presented by the prosecutor who stands in for the United States Senators on this committee. The FBI could have gathered facts about the music or the conversation or any other details about the gathering that occurred that evening. That is standard procedure in a sexual assault case. In fact, the manual that is, was signed off by Ms. Mitchell, the manual that is posted on the Maricopa County Attorney's website as a guiding principle and best practices for what should happen with sexual assault cases, 
highlights the details of what should happen in terms of the need for an objective investigation into any sexual assault case. It says, quote, effective investigation requires cooperation with a multidisciplinary team that includes medical professionals, victim advocates, dedicated forensic interviewers, criminalists, and other law enforcement members. The manual also stresses the importance of obtaining outside witness information. You have bravely come forward. You have bravely come forward. And I want to thank you because you clearly have nothing to gain for what you have done. You have been a true patriot in fighting for the best of who we are as a country. I believe you are doing that because you love this country. And I believe history will show that you are a true profile in courage at this moment in time in the history of our country. And I thank you.